So we finished up chapter three, and now we're in chapter four of comes comes after three. The marriage mentor becoming the couple you long to be, and we are working through these chapters together with you, hanging out, and um, we're in chapter four. And Steve's probably used more words today than he uses, except on Sunday when he preaches and talks to a million people. <laughs> Uh, we're on the chapter, Your Marriage Can Survive Toddlers and Teens. That's the, uh, that's the tough one. Mm -hmm. um, I, to start with, your kids are going to move out one day. Hopefully they're not going to be 35 living on your couch playing video yeah, games. If yours are doing that, <laughs> I'm sorry for you. It's time. Move them on. Um, Unplug. The devices. Get it, get it done. Get them out. It's, they're, they're finished. But uh, your kids are moving out. And um, man, there's so much to, as we were thinking about doing this, I just, yeah, I almost got overwhelmed because what do you do in a few minutes? But I think the main points you got to understand is you want to raise kids who love Christ, who love the Lord, who serve Him the way you do. But they are going to move out. They're not a reflection of you. You don't find your value and your worth in your kids. Uh, ladies, if you're controlling and... Or dads. Well, dads too. Uh, controlling, uh, harsh, uh, any of those things, that's going to go so against what you're trying to accomplish when you raise kids, uh, what they're going to turn out to be. Man, it, this, this thing is just go on and on. And, and, and we won't ferret at all out today? No, but I think we can give them some direction. Okay. Some of the ways. First of all, the chapter is a good one to read. So if you didn't oh, yeah. read it, go back and read it. If, in fact, I would say that we wouldn't even have to tell you. If you would read it, we wouldn't have to talk to you. It's, 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 <laughs> it's kind of all there. So Yes. But I think um, the reality is when we have a baby, we are so wanting to have a baby. And I talk about that in the first part of the chapter, how my friend Beth, hi Beth, had a baby and I was like, oh, I want one too. And her baby didn't have colic. Her baby sucked on a passy and swung in a swing all day long. And I finally had a baby that cried and cried and cried and cried. Oh, and it was really hard. It redefined what crying was. Yeah, and I didn't know anything about colic or anything about babies, really. I didn't like her. So, who, the baby? <laughs> he likes you now, Meredith. <laughs> but for the first three joy, months, we were like overwhelmed, her. and it was really stressful, oh. and we just didn't know what to do about it. And it's interesting, because kind of what you've been saying through a lot of these chapters, when we do premarital counseling, we talk to couples about, if you're not willing to serve your spouse for the rest of your life, don't even marry them. Interestingly enough, if you're not willing to serve your children until they leave your house, don't have any. But nobody tells you that. No. <laughs> they just no. tell you, it's going to be so fun. Well, it's what you're Someone supposed to love. do. It's expected. <laughs> it's, it's... And you want them. But yeah. then when they, you have them and you realize it's a lot of work, uh, it is delightful and joyful, and our children are the joy of our lives, and they're our favorite people on the planet. But oh. that didn't happen by accident. I'd rather be with them than anybody. Yes, but that happened because well, we... Well, except for you, who I'm... Oh, all y'all. Yeah. We put a lot of time into helping them mold their character to be the people we want to enjoy being with. A lot of times it's interesting because we will hear people complain about the way that their kids are from the time they're little, all, you know, on through up complain about the way they react, the way they treat their siblings, um, but they don't really know what to do to help Well, it's almost they feel like they, they can't do anything. Like, well, it's his bent, it's mm -hmm. his personality. My, my child is hard on people. It's like, well, then you work on that. You yeah. don't just yeah. allow it to happen mm -hmm. and kind of throw your hands up. And I think we do that sometimes as, as parents. Okay. We just kind of get to a point where you go, well, it's not working and I don't know what to do, so let's just pacify him, keep him happy so he doesn't get upset. Keep him busy, put him keep in sports, him busy, more sports, more planet. this, more that, but rather than really molding him and, and uh, really directing him toward toward what God would really be delighted in having him do. And it's a um, ministry. There's yeah, a ministry of parenting, yeah. and God calls us to ministries, and when, whatever he calls us to, he will equip us to do. But we have to study it in God's Word. Exactly. We have to find people yeah, you don't that just have, sit back and let it come to you. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's pursuing wisdom. what it is. Find people who've raised kids that are a walk ahead of you mm -hmm. so that they can mentor you, help you see things that you don't see. I think of, um, in my book, I'm going to plug my book. 
Moms Raising Sons to be Men, if you have any sons, and it's actually a good parenting book. Harvest House Publishers asked me to write a book for moms of sons. I have two sons and two daughters, but in that book I tell a story of a couple that we really admired the way these guys raised their kids. They didn't raise their voice when they asked them to do something or not to do something. They were very consistent with consequences for behaviors that didn't measure up. And I remember one day when Meredith was about, I don't know, three, maybe four, she was skipping through the church after church was over and she was making noise and I kept shushing her. And these friends of ours, Vaughn and Molly, Vaughn asked me, why do you care? And because I, I started getting irritated. And finally he pressed me till I said, because I don't want people to think I'm a bad mom. And Vaughn said, don't ever raise your kids for what people think of you. And I got to tell you, that was golden. And if you don't go anyway, leave with anything else, leave with that. Steve mentioned that. They're not a reflection of us. In fact, God calls us. He says he created us for his glory. And a lot of times we tell our kids, don't act like that because it misrepresents me as a parent. And we're really s stealing the glory. We're trying to do it for our own glory instead of helping them you know, live in a manner that honors Christ. Toddlers. Uh you talk about toddlers. I don't want to talk about toddlers. Okay. Yeah. But toddlers are interesting breed because they're just selfish little sinners that want their way. And what the Bible calls us to is to raise up our child according to their bent. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. We have to study our kids' bent. We have to learn their behavior. I think of when Merit, I mean Brandon and Kayla, those were our two youngest and they were only two years, two months apart. And Kayla was a little bit rough on Brandon. And I can remember in my kitchen one day, when she was probably two, he was probably four, and he was taught never hit a girl. Ever. Never lash out. Never hit ever. a girl in anger. Ever. 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 And uh, we would tell him, you know, if you hit your sister, you're going to grow up one day and you're going to hit your wife or you're going to hit your daughters. You know, if you grow up. That kind of man. Yeah, because daddy won't <laughs> let you grow up. And one day, she was in the kitchen with him, and, and she had a few days earlier, she had accidentally bumped his nose and it bled, and little. Little did he know it was an accident, but uh, a few days later she had him up against the refrigerator because he wouldn't do something that she wanted him to do. And she said, Brandon, don't make me make your nose bleed. You know I can. And Brandon looked over at Steve for some help, and we literally had to turn our backs and laugh because yeah. it was... He had his hands down yeah. to the side just looking like... <laughs> help me from you this help me here, crazy Dad? toddler. Huh? But, all that to say... But he didn't touch her. No, he, he didn't. He put his hand on her. And you know, that's what the laboratory of learning. Our home is a place where God gives us 18 short years, only 18 summers, to pour... Or 17, if you're lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To pour into our kids qualities that are going to take them into life. So instead of being inconvenienced by those conflicts between your toddlers or your children, um, really understand it's an opportunity to train them to be selfless or forgiving or to withhold responding out of anger and hitting someone. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work, but in the end, I want to be with my kids more than anybody else on the planet. And that didn't come because we just let them live you know, the way that they would based on their bent. Uh, you give yourself this great gift if you work on helping them have character qualities that honor Christ. And it gives them a great gift. It does, it's true. And then they get married and they, uh, you know, we're watching our kids raise kids that also are learning the same thing that we taught them. Now you may be watching this and you may be like, oh, my kids are grown and I didn't do it that way or, you know, it's too late now, we're, this is where we're at, what do we do? Uh, you know, you can live in regret and get stuck there or you can realize there is a way that you can raise your kids wherever, whatever age they're at in your home Ask for some help. Read great books. There's a book called Shepherding a Child's Heart by Tripp. Uh, read, uh, uh, go to Bible studies that help you with that, or mentor, you know, men, go to men's Bible studies and find some older men that have raised some kids. Yeah. And, and oh, that doesn't help if your kid's are already gone. Uh, no, I wasn't talking about that. I'm talking about like your, your junior high or teenager. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but that, if, if they're already gone, and you say, well, I've blown it, and I, you know, this chapter's not for me, and, and whatever. Well, that, that, that's fine, you can go there. On the other hand, you have an opportunity, too, to go and ask for forgiveness where maybe you've blown it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I wasn't consistent as a mom or as a dad. Or I was angry. I, I was angry, or I, or I was controlling, or I, uh, I, I tried to manipulate you to do things and what I wanted, and I didn't give you the right uh, direction in following Christ. 
um, I wasn't the right example, whatever. And, but it's a great opportunity for you as you've learned these things and as you start to apply them to your own life. Well, why wouldn't you go then to your children and still exude that kind of, we talk about humility, right? That's humility. You're going to them saying, man, I did not do what I was supposed to do. Uh, please forgive me and understand that from here on out, uh, I will be pointing you to Christ. And, and that's going to be the important part of, of my life to you. So it's never too late for that. And, and even though you might think, oh, well, we blew it. Let's move on. Uh, no, it's, it's not too late. It's not too late. Here, here's the reality. You do what you're supposed to do, everything you're supposed to do, but you know what? God's the one who has to hit the heart. Mm -hmm. And even with their, our discipline and everything we do with our kids, God still has to do the work in our heart. I can make these perfect little model children do what they're supposed to do all while they're growing up, and guess what? They can leave my house and go live the life they want to and be completely, completely contrary to everything I taught them. God has got to do that work. And that's the only, the only thing we do is be faithful to the Word, faithful to God, faithful to do what we're supposed to do, and let God do the work in their lives. I have no guarantee that any of my kids are going to follow Christ. To do. Now, I have promises from the Bible that tell me that if I do stay faithful in these things, I've got the probability that they're going to turn out this way. I get that. But the heart belongs to God. And, the, and God is the only one who can change a heart. So if you're trying to do it yourself, uh, whether they're old and out of your house or whether they're young, uh, you're, you're hitting a brick wall. Uh, you've got to stay faithful. You've got to stay, uh, men, you've got to be that spiritual leader in your house. Um, and I know that maybe some of you don't want to hear that, but that's what you've got to be. You've got to be determined that I'm going to bring glory and honor to my Lord by being that spiritual leader that I need to be in this house. And ladies, if your husband's not being that, uh, that's just something else for you to be on your knees about before the Lord, because uh, that's what call, God calls them to be. We, I think, should I talk about my buddy? Sure. Uh, I have a friend named uh, Ken, and I don't think he'll mind me talking about him because I wrote about him. In the book. <laughs> He's a great guy. I love Ken. Ken. Ken is one of these guys who, years ago when I came to this church, he was, you know, nominal Christian. He loved the Lord. He, you know, said he believed. But he started getting really involved in knowing Christ, following after Christ, experiencing what that relationship with Jesus Christ was like, and it changed this man's life. Um, he was a man who kind of pursued, you know, the, the Sunday afternoon, riding the dirt bikes with the boys, you know, going out on a sailboat, uh, doing all that stuff, Kate making sure his son uh, was out there in the circuit. And, racing and doing all these other things on, on dirt bikes and what have you. And he was a fun guy. I mean, he was a great dad to have. Uh, but that was Ken. And, and, and he would stay away from church on Sunday because he had some track meet he had to be at or some deal that they had to do. When he came to the reality of, of what his life was supposed to be, following Christ, diligently seeking Him, when he realized uh, uh, Sunday is, is, you know, as John says in, in in Revelation, and I was in the Spirit on the day of, on the, day of the Lord, and um, he recognized that, you know what, Sunday is the day that we go and we worship together with our family, and it changed his life, and uh, as he's raising uh, a couple young boys even now, uh, we're seeing that consistency and that love that he has, so all those years that, that he wasn't doing that, and he had his wife at home praying for him and just praying diligently, taking her kids to church, doing what she was supposed to be doing, yet she had this husband that wasn't being obedient to the Lord in all things, but she was praying for him. And she didn't, and she didn't manipulate him or guilt him. Guilt him, uh, harangue him, mm -hmm. manipulate him, try to get him to do what she wanted him to do, because it was the right thing to do. Um, rather, she prayed for him, uh, loved him unconditionally, and continued just doing what God's called her to do, faithful in that. And sooner or later, God, like we were talking about, bring the heart around. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to do it by manipulation, by control, by trying to take the, the lead and do that. It's, it's only by God's grace that He, uh, that he does, touches that heart. He brings it to, uh, to really what He says from that heart of stone to a heart of flesh. And, and that's what we saw him do in Ken. And that was an amazing, amazing story. Changed his life. Yeah. So his kids uh, now get the, re, uh, the benefit of that life change and that consistency of a daddy that just loves Jesus. Mm -hmm. And 
Prayer is probably one of the most neglected resources that we have as parents. People, uh, when all we have left, will pray. When my child is finally not going to respond to everything I've tried, we pray. Uh, I think of Moses on the hilltop when he, Joshua was down fighting the battle and he was interceding for them. And when his arms got tired and he was bringing them down was when Joshua started losing the battle. And sometimes when our kids are you know, at school, public school, private school, home school, whatever it is that you do, uh, when your kids are out in the world remembering to pray diligently for them, for, for God to capture their hearts. When our kids, when we lived in Texas, I remember when I would drop them off at public school and they would get out of the car, I would watch them until I couldn't watch them anymore and I'm like, getting all misty eyed about it. I miss that, those days. And I remember, I'm I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't pray Oh, God, help them to be good kids. Oh, God, help them to get good grades. I prayed, God, help them to love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Father, lead them not into temptation. Deliver them from the evil one. I prayed that every day that my kids walked into the public school campus that they walked onto. We were praying for our kids from the time that they were born uh, for a couple things. Number one, we prayed that they would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, yes. first and foremost. Uh, that we would be able to spend eternity in heaven with them. That was, that prayer just never, yeah. never, never got denied. Uh, we, we never got that set on the side. We always, that was a prayer. The other thing we prayed for was for their uh, future spouse, which might sound kind of silly, but, you know, you pray for a, a two-month-old baby spouse. We figured somewhere out there, uh, for my daughters, uh, their spouse was probably already born someplace, maybe one, two years old. I don't know. They might have been younger. Maybe they weren't born yet. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just let me have this. And um, we would pray for them, whoever that person might be. We prayed that God might keep my daughter pure and that she wouldn't give herself to anybody until that time when they walked the aisle. Well, that, that's something you never pray for in today's society. I mean, it's unthinkable to have somebody be pure as they walk the aisle. Um, Say, pray the same thing for my son, whatever that girl is. Mm -hmm. Father, may he keep himself pure for her, and may she keep herself pure for him. And we saw that prayer answered in all of our kids uh, as we as, as we watch them grow and watch them get married. And so I don't think it was silly to to spend that time praying for that, but that was on our hearts. And so. What, what you're starting to see, hopefully, is what's on your heart as you're raising your kids. It's not getting through the day-to-day -day mundane, do this, do that, you know, make sure your clothes are picked up, make sure you got your homework done. I, I know that's all important, it's got its place, but what's important always on your mind is where are they going to be spiritually. And, and Yeah, and getting that, that big view of what are we going, how can we play into them becoming children of God. Um, recognizing, I know it's all God's business, I get that, I know that, but I think we play a very vital role in directing him to that and giving him heart for that. Yes, and I think one of the things you talked about with Ken and being a part of a church family, so many people neglect taking their family to church. Mm -hmm. And you were a youth pastor or youth in ministry for 18 years. And a lot of times what parents do is they're just busy when their kids are little. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they have been good things like, oh, soccer. You know, just so you know this, those of you that are younger, they never used to play baseball and soccer and all those sports on Sundays because families went to church. Right. But because Christians haven't put their foot down and said, no, my kid will not play on that day, they'll be at church. Now, I don't think even people realize that we didn't used to play sports on Sundays. Now, this is a little aside, and you can listen to it or not. I have no idea why kids have to play so many sports anyway, but I'm just saying, yeah, right. you played baseball, or yes, you played football, you or you picked one, you picked thing, one and, and did right. that. Because I think what parents think is if I can keep my kid busy enough, I'm gonna keep, keep them out of trouble, trouble. and kidding. then, Really, you cannot keep a kid busy enough to not have them find or have trouble find them. And then when they get to junior high and they start going sideways, they drop them off at youth group and they tell the youth pastor, uh, I need him. help, he's broken, she's broken. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that God can't do a work. It doesn't mean that God can't capture the heart of one of those kids. But I tell you what, it was easier to tell a kid who'd never heard about God or was raised in a family that was completely anti-God, Jesus loves you, and they would listen than it was to tell a kid who was in and out of church, raised by parents who 
were apathetic or nominal Christians, mm -hmm. said they believed in Jesus, but didn't have this passionate walk with Christ, didn't desire to make Christ known. Just hypocrites. You know, hypocrites. Yeah. And those kids, 75% of those they kids, don't want, they, they don't want anything they want to, do, to do with it. And it doesn't so mean that can't. Well, it's a dangerous thing. And, and, and again, understand, God changes the heart. We don't change it. Right. But we are to be faithful with what God has given us. And, and you get one shot at this. And that's, yeah, that's one the one shot. shot you get. Once they're gone, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and there's not to bring any um, guilt on anybody or, you know, put over pressure, but just making sure your walk with God is exactly what it needs to be. And, and growing in that and letting them see that and letting them know, letting your kids see the joy of the Lord in you. Mm -hmm. Because if they're not seeing the joy of the Lord in you, there's no way they're going to get it. Right. Um, in fact, they're going to go find their joy in something else. And so it's it's very it becomes very important, and it becomes what I think is more critical to raising your kids than even making sure they're busy in sports or making sure they're getting good grades or making sure they're doing all these things that the world says, oh, these are good things to do. They're not bad things. I get that, but there's so much more when, especially in this. What God calls us perverse generation. We we we, we find ourselves in uh, where everything in this generation is against your kid doing well in the things of the Lord. And so, if you're having them spend all these time all this time doing these things that are good things, but not really important to who they are as believers, maybe you back them up a little bit and let them have a little bit of. Now the Bible says just, you know, be still and know that I am God. Not be busy and I'll kind of figure out how to get in, get in there so you know me. No, teach them how to be still. Teach them how to know God. Teach the them how to be. Uh, put the, uh, don't give them a phone. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, give me. <laughs> um, teach them how to love God. Teach them, teach them to read His Word. Uh, one of the things that we do at our church, I'm just going off here. Go, baby, go. Um, one of the things that we do at church with our with our kids is we teach them a lot of scripture. We have a, a, a I don't think Kevin will ever listen to this, so I can use his name. I, I love Kevin. He's 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 a guy. He's about my age. No, he's younger than me. But man, he, he's wearing out. He's 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 starting to slow down. But he he's loves our years. little kids, he's and he's ministry. done it for years. Faithful to the Lord. Faithful to teach these kids. Love these little kids. I don't know how he does. I couldn't keep up with him. He's he's an amazing man. But he teaches them scripture. He makes them memorize God's word. And we see these kids coming up through the years, and some of them in high school. Some of them now are doing ministry in our church and leading groups and, and leading married different each things. other. Married each other. And you know what? When you go to them, they know God's word. And and it's because he didn't just play games with them. He didn't just take them out on the little circle and, and play little dodgeball games. They did that and had fun. But he was infusing them with God's Word. And he gave them booklets that they could be in God's Word every day. Studying His Word, reading, writing little things about God's Word, learning God's Word. Quiet times. Quiet times, spending time alone with the Lord. And so that is... We're, you see that over the years start to develop in these kids where they truly start to follow Christ. They're not just following after religion, not just doing what mom and dad do, but they're themselves following after Christ. And so, man, that's just... I know. One, this thing can go I know. And then, the and then the thing is, when you realize the urgency, and I know we're kind of talking like there's this urgency, but it really is. Parents are the architects of the next generation. And we look at what's wrong in the world. Uh, you know, if your dad listening, your kids need you. Uh, the, the absentee fathers, uh, if you're married to somebody else and you have kids with someone else, your kids need you. They need to have you in their life. They need to know that you care, that you love them, that you affirm them. But there is an urgency that you need to realize. It's easy to just say, I want to be happy in my marriage, and if I'm not, I'm going to take these kids and I'm going to go somewhere where I can be happy. And children are most secure when they see mom and dad love each other, when they see that mom and dad's relationship is stable, that it's grounded in their love for Christ, you will raise kids that are secure yeah. and stable. Which means I have to get rid of my selfishness, I gotta get rid of my pride, mm -hmm. I gotta get rid of my... Uh, resentment. Really resentment and, and resentment and bitterness and lack of forgiveness and all that stuff to to the person who I'm married to. And, and a lot of times, 
just that can fix all sorts of garbage right. that's going on. Right. So, And forgiving people raise forgiving people. And there's going to be a day when your kids are going to need to forgive you. And if you haven't raised them to be forgiving people... Well, just like writing home in church and, you know, roasting the pastor or people in the church because they don't measure up to what they're, they're supposed to be doing, the kids are here in the back seat. Well, either they're going to reject it, deny it, and walk away from it because it's, it's all a joke and, and they're a bunch of hypocrites, or or they're going to become like you, yeah. <laughs> which might be worse. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll be the next generation of and, people. And we know you aren't doing that. No, no, one you're not. who would do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you guys are perfect. They're, they're we over love there. You. They're yeah. over there. Yeah. Yeah. See other guys. The guys listening behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not you. Not you. <laughs> but that becomes very, very important because then we have another generation. You could nip that in the bud right now. Say, oh no, we don't talk about others like that. Yeah, oh no, we love, listen, we we love what God's doing in their life. We pray that God does more. Uh, instead of pointing out, because we like to point out other people's errors to our kids, because then that's teaching them not to do that. <laughs> Let me just laugh with you. Yeah. <laughs> Wrong. It doesn't work that way. If they become more like that. Now they become the ones who are judgmental, who think they know more than everybody else. And and boy, mom and dad, we got it all together. But those people, they're really off the wall. Guess what? Pride goes before a fall. Doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work. And you'll have those kids. Yeah. And, and I think you only have 18, 18 years. years. And then realizing that kids want to wedge between you, and if they can work you against each other, they will. Because they can get their way if they can get you to fight about what it is they can or cannot do or what they have or have not done or what consequence. Have those conversations between yourselves behind closed doors. Yeah, you don't need to. Yeah. Kids don't need to be. I, I know there's parents out there like the kids to experience all the stuff that the whole family experiences. but uh, It makes them insecure. Yeah, it, it makes they, they can't handle that. No. Uh, and, and it doesn't mean that you pretend like there's never an issue. Uh, but you handle it properly and then you always come out united front you always come out loving one another You never hold the grudges. You never talk about the other person. You know, oh, your mom this and oh, you know, your dad that. does this yeah. uh, Man, uh, if you've I mean, been that's doing that, mom. apologize to your kids yeah. and tell them you're not going to do it anymore Well, that's part of that thing that you can go back and say I'm sorry for it, yeah. you know, yeah, so it's just yeah. And then I think, book and you'll I think one more thing, when you're junior high, especially, well, my daughters did it too, sons and daughters, they start to push mom away, or they start to push mom's buttons to get their mm -hmm. way. Oh yeah, and my boy did that. Yeah, and I that talk about good. that in Moms Raising Sons to Be Men. And when Steve said, don't talk to my wife like that. Uh, uh, it's not quite how it was said. How was it said? It was said, you will not. Talk to my wife like that. See his nostrils flaring? That The kids knew that meant dad's yelling. When yeah. his nostrils flared, trouble. <laughs> you will not talk to my wife like that. And he looked at me with, I think the book talks about it. And, yeah. And it doesn't yeah. really reflect it yeah. the same way. But uh, he looked at me and, and, and he kind of got this look in his eye and he goes, that's my mom. I go, oh no. <laughs> oh no, no, no. <laughs> that's my wife. And you will not talk to my wife like that. Yeah. When you treat her well, then I could say you're, she's your mother. But it, that, uh, oh. I'm telling you, it's kind of like that saying, I love you, huh? is yes, it's like. <laughs> Got in trouble for that one. <laughs> Having him say that when my kids tried to get, because you cry, you try, oh, I love you, how can you say it? I don't care, you know, and they, when your kids know they can push those buttons, then they feel like they kind of got a little victory there, when that junior high age, uh, that's I surviving, call it pre yeah, he does, uh, but when he steps in and says, eh, eh, that's my wife, that is knight in shining armor material right there, and then wives, I think it was a good night, I'm sure it was, and then wives, we have to be careful that we don't then go rescue our kids from the mm. consequence, because it's, so funny, one side of us wants him to step in, and the other side of us will, oh, oh protect my but don't ground them, there's a party this weekend they want to go to, or don't take their car keys away, because then I have to drive them, or yeah. whatever that thing is. Well, a 10-year-old shouldn't have car yeah, keys yeah, yeah. <laughs> But being united in those areas is just important. So, it is in this chapter, I know we haven't probably talked a ton about what's in the chapter, I think um, we have. Did we? Talk about Kim. Yeah, yeah, we talked about That's Kim. That's all I care Kim's about. Awesome. I just want to talk about Kim. Yes. And yes. Kevin, I talked about Kevin. He's not even in a book. That was free. Oh, yeah. Kevin. Kevin's in Kevin. Mom's Raising Sense to Be Men, I Doesn't think. Doesn't matter. It's I not in this he one. He is, yeah. Um, 
And then on um, my wife's perspective that I wrote to actually to the husbands, are we the only ones who found raising toddlers and teens increased the stress in our marriage? I remember begging Steve to let me have a baby. And then after our first child was born, I remember thinking nobody told us how hard this was going to be. And they probably told us, but we just didn't hear it. No. We said, no. It's you just can't yeah. <laughs> so yeah, read that chapter. Uh, if you have more questions, don't you ask can. us. Don't yeah. somewhere else. <laughs> but if you're not going to a church, start there. Find a church that you can be a part of. That uh, has kids around. That has a good kids program. If you program. have no kids around, yeah. If there's no kids around, you're probably unless you're already in a church that just doesn't have any kids and you love that church, then pray that God will send kids that you can minister to. Yeah. Or parents that you can learn from. Yeah. So it's important. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, your marriage can survive toddlers and teens. Yeah, but it probably won't. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> oh, sorry. Take it back. Did I say that out loud? Just kidding. Is that, I think it's off. No, it's not. It's not. All right. <laughs> now you're going to be fine. Yeah. <laughs>